particularly pleased once again to have the Family Research Council here. And would you join me as I bring to the stage now the president of, once again, the Family Research Council, a mighty warrior for life, Tony Perkins. Would you welcome Tony as he comes? Bishop, thank you. Thank you for hosting us here at New Horizon Church, and I want to thank all of you for being here tonight in Jackson, Mississippi, and I want to thank all of you who are joining us from across the country and literally around the world as we pray together for life. You know, 49 years ago, Bishop, on January 22nd, 1973, the United States Supreme Court struck down a Texas law that upheld the sanctity of human life essentially legalizing abortion all across the nation all through nine months of pregnancy. And that happened for our entire country. But over the last half a century, the result of the court's decision has been the death of over 60 million babies. But that's not all. Abortion on demand has left our society believing that a child's life is a choice to be made rather than a gift created in the image of God to be cherished and embraced. The indifference and the callous view of the unborn has contributed to the devaluing of all human life, as the streets of America so tragically attest. Tonight, we gather from coast to coast, border to border, to pray together for life to pray for godly wisdom for the United States Supreme Court, which will hear the oral arguments on Wednesday, this Wednesday, December the 1st, in a case originating right here in Jackson, Mississippi. It is Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, which, by the way, I have to say, it's not a health organization, it's an abortion business. We're here to pray for our country to embrace life once again, to pray for the church to lead the way by example. You know, the early church in Acts chapter 2, we read that they're gathered in one place with one mind, with one purpose. Tonight, we're gathered here in Jackson and across America with one mind. And that is to pray that God would restore an understanding that he alone is the author of life and we are the beneficiaries if we embrace that truth. You know, the psalmist wrote, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. So tonight we are here with no other purpose or plan we are here to publicly declare, as the scriptures do, that God is the author of all human life. And we're here to pray together for our nation that it would once again recognize that truth. And Bishop, I again want to thank you for hosting us here tonight. And I'm going to ask you to open our time together tonight with a word of prayer. Join me as I pray. Father, in the wonderful and strong name of Jesus the Christ, God, I come tonight asking that, God, that you would give us change in this country. Yes. God, a change was made all of these years ago that resulted in the death of over 60 million children. And, God, now we ask for change again. Yes. God, that will result now in multi-millions and billions of children being alive. Mm. God, bless us. Help us. Thank you that we can come together, God, and let our voices be heard. And God, tonight, may you touch every person, all of those that are here, all of those across this country. Lord, that they would take a stand for life. Yes. Lord, so that change will come. We thank you for it now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bishop. Tonight you are going to hear from leaders from across the spectrum. Different denominations, different ethnic backgrounds, different stories, different political parties, but united around one issue tonight, 
and that is the sanctity of human life. Tonight, we're honored to begin our evening with a message from Mississippi's 65th governor, Governor Tate Reeves. As Mississippi prepares for this landmark Supreme Court case, he appeared on Meet the Press this morning to proudly defend the state's pro-life law. I love leaders who don't back up. He believes, he believes in this fundamental truth. Abortion takes an innocent life. Governor, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you, thank you, Bishop Crudup, for hosting us here tonight. Uh, for those of you that, that maybe don't know the bishop, I, I, I've known him a long time, and I, I don't know anyone who loves the Lord more than Bishop Crudup. And what a, what a wonderful man to Tony Perkins and your Family Research Council and, and people from all across this great country. Thank you for, for being here uh, tonight. Whether you are here with us in person or, or if you drove from out of state, we want to welcome you to the great state of Mississippi. For those of you that are watching online, we're glad that you're visiting the hospitality state from wherever you are watching. We're also so very pleased to have so many pro-life allies with us here tonight. I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, we are deeply grateful for your efforts. It's reassuring as a leader to know that we are fighting for the lives of unborn children and that we are fighting together. Yes, yes. Now, we know that tonight Mississippi is the epicenter of the pro-life movement. Tonight, Americans from all across the country stand together to protect and defend those who cannot protect and defend themselves. Tonight, I submit to you, we are all Mississippians. And tonight, we pray together, we're going to work together, and we're going to fight together to make this nation the safest place in the world for an unborn child. Wednesday, Wednesday morning, hopefully, will be the beginning of a new day in our struggle to protect the most vulnerable. On Wednesday, as you are well aware, we will be arguing Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization before the Supreme Court of the United States of America. There are just not really enough words how historic this case is, not only for Mississippi, but for our nation and for the 62 million babies who've been aborted since Roe versus Wade was wrongfully enacted. Now, I think too many politicians are afraid to say it, but I'll say it. Abortion is barbaric. <laughs> Abortion is evil. It's probably the greatest evil of our day. Every single day in America, thousands of children lose their God-given inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I was asked earlier today why those who are on the other side of this are wrong when they say, my body, my choice. It's a pretty simple answer. Because there is a baby inside that womb that deserves to be protected. And if people like me and you do not stand up for the unborn child, then who will? Because they cannot stand up to defend themselves. And I do not believe, despite what some on the other side may say, that it's unreasonable to believe that law should be in place to preserve and to protect the sanctity of human life, to preserve and protect the most vulnerable amongst us, especially when that human life cannot protect themselves. 
And despite their claims about who does and who doesn't support protecting life, let me tell you this. I believe in my heart that God is doing great things here in America because we're seeing more and more people agree with us and learn more as they learn more and more about the horrific acts that take place during an abortion. I believe that every single life is a gift from God. And the reason I believe that is because I believe what it says in the Bible, as is right here, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. When I ran for office, I made a commitment to the people of our state, and I made a commitment to God. I made a commitment that I would do everything in my power to make our state the safest state in the nation for an unborn child. Now, I want to make sure everybody understands where we find ourselves today. If we are successful, because the other side wants you to believe that our current laws in America are normal. They're not. If we are successful and this 15-week ban is upheld at the Supreme Court on Wednesday, even with that, there are 42 countries in Europe that allow elective abortions. If our 15-week ban is successful, there will still be 39 countries in Europe that allow, that have more restrictive abortion policies than the most conservative state in the nation in America. This fight will not be over. We have to understand that. Now, I have a, a unique perspective on this particular bill. Not only is it my great honor and privilege to help fight this fight as Mississippi's governor, I also served as the president of the state senate and helped usher this bill to our prior governor's desk. You see, I have a unique perspective. And I want you to know that tonight I'm going to make another commitment. I promise you no matter the outcome in this case, I will never stop fighting to preserve life. I make a commitment to you tonight that I will never stop trying to protect those who cannot stand up for themselves. And regardless of the outcome, I will continue working with leaders to pass legislation that continues to work towards that goal of Mississippi being the safest place in America for an unborn child. And ultimately, if we are successful, if the court does recognize that Casey was incorrectly ruled upon in 1992 because many of the justices decided that they wouldn't read the Constitution but they would consider the prevailing political opinion from their perceptions at the time. I can assure you that if these justices on the, Mrs. On the U.S. Supreme Court tonight, this week and in the coming months recognize that when you read the U.S. Constitution, there is no constitutional right to an abortion. And there also is no right and nothing in the Constitution that prevents a state like Mississippi from regulating these types of acts. And so not only was Casey ruled upon wrongly, I believe in my heart that Roe v. Wade was as well. But I can assure you, regardless, we're going to continue this fight. The sanctity of life, the future of our children. Mississippi is at the forefront of protecting both. And I firmly believe that that's what it's at stake when we make these arguments on Wednesday before this court. I want you to know again, we wouldn't be here tonight if it weren't for a lot of you that are in this room and for all of you that are watching online from places across Mississippi and across America and probably even across the world. We wouldn't be here without you. You are the rock that gives politicians the courage to stand up and do what's right. And so I ask you to continue that fight. I thank you for your efforts. And because 
in Mississippi, in our state seal, we put our nation's motto in our state seal. You see, in Mississippi, we believe that's in God we trust. And so, if you would, if it's okay, I'd like to lead us in a prayer as we go into this week. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight not as members of some political party, not as Republicans or Democrats or Independents. We don't come to you tonight even as Americans or, or non-Americans. We come to you tonight as children of God. We come to you tonight recognizing that you have taught us in your Bible. You have taught us that it is not our responsibility on earth to do our will, but to do your will. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this day. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to experience friends and allies and, and others across this nation to say hello, to enjoy the beautiful weather that we had here today in Mississippi. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon each of us. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you tonight with a humble heart. I come to you tonight asking for your continued guidance, your continued wisdom. But dear Heavenly Father, we knew when this legislation was initially passed that we would have a fight on our hands. And so I come to you tonight asking for you to continue to provide the strength. Not only for myself, but for other leaders across this great state and across this great nation. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with our legal counsel. Please be with Attorney General Fitch and her team as they make the arguments before the United States Supreme Court later this week. Please be with all of the justices of the United States Supreme Court as they hear these arguments and they, as they consider and contemplate the potential outcomes of this case. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so dearly. We love you so dearly. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with Americans of all stripes, those who agree with us, and please, dear Heavenly Father, as you've promised to do, please look over and be with those who perhaps do not because they are children of God as well. Dear Heavenly Father, I trust that you're going to provide all parties the wisdom that they need to make their arguments. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that some 49 years ago a case was decided that 62 million American babies did not live. to experience life. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with those among us that are hurting because of that. Please be with those among us that are just hurting in general. Please help guide all of us to do Your will. Dear Heavenly Father, most of all, I come to You tonight and say thank you. I say thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that all of us can be saved. We know that we are all sinners, but we all know that through everlasting life, you are the eternal light. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing all of these people together tonight to pray for our nation to pray for our state, to pray for individuals across this country. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us. Provide us the strength and the guidance and the wisdom to do your will. It's in Jesus' name that I come to you in prayer tonight. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Governor. I am grateful for our political leaders who not only do the right thing, but will pray and ask God to lead them in doing the right thing. Governor, thank you so much for being with us tonight. As the governor mentioned, it is Wednesday morning. The Supreme Court will be taking up these the oral arguments in the Dobbs case, and we're now going to go to the East Coast. We're going to go to the steps of the Supreme Court, where two of our pro-life leaders are going to lead us in prayer. Joining us at the Supreme Court tonight is Marjorie Dannenfelser. She is the president of the Susan B. Anthony's List. SBA's mission is to end abortion by electing national leaders like the governor and others who advocate for laws that protect and save human life. And she has a special calling at SBA to promote pro-life women leaders. Also joining us from the steps of the Supreme Court tonight is Mike Ferris. He is president and CEO of Alliance Defending Freedom, where he begins to roll, he, he prays because he comes with a very diverse background as an effective litigator, educator, public advocate, and communicator. And he's widely recognized for his successful work on both the national and international stage. He has argued before appellate courts of 13 states, eight Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, and the U.S. Supreme Court. Please welcome Marjorie Dannenfelser and Mike Ferris. Thank you, Tony. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the opportunity to commit our way in this case to you. Lord, as we stand here in front of the Supreme Court where this case will be argued on Wednesday, Lord, I lift up those who are preparing now to argue the case. I thank you so much for Attorney General Lynn Fitch and her role and her leadership and her scholarship and her courage in this case. And I thank you for Scott Stewart, the Solicitor General, who will be arguing this case for the state of Mississippi. Lord, I pray that you would anoint them, even now as they're in the final stages of preparation. The next two days, there's gonna be a lot of practice. Lord, I pray that you'd make that practice effective and that they would not be asked any questions that they haven't prepared the answer for and know exactly how to answer. Lord, you tell us that when you're called before people to give an answer, that you'll give them the answer. Lord, I pray that you would give Scott the answers he needs to answer or write. And Lord, when the morning comes, and will that bell rings five minutes before the case starts, and when the Chief Justice calls the case and Scott begins, Lord, I pray that you would make him winsome, eloquent, forceful, and a truth teller that will do what is right and say what is right and will be prevailing in his speech. And Lord, I pray that he would shine like a star compared to those who oppose him. And Lord, I pray that for his success, in the, in the argument, because it's not his success that we seek, it's, it's the success for your principles. And Lord, I pray that you would anoint them, protect them, give them your providence and your protection. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Lord, we come before you gathered across the nation and here at the Supreme Court of the United States, where the fate of the children you intend for this world will be decided. We come in great hope that your purposes for their lives may be fulfilled because of the principles embedded in our founding documents that this court is bound to affirm. Lord, your children, unborn, their mothers, fathers, and their communities have suffered greatly. But we believe not in vain. We hope in our suffering because in it, we have grown in perseverance. We've grown in, grown in character that has brought us to this hope, this hope that never fails. We grieve the loss of your children formed in you and sent for your purposes, for their mothers whom you love and who needed more than they received from us, and over the deep scars that aborting your children has inflicted upon the soul of this great nation. We're grateful, grateful for all that has brought us here. Decades of prayer, the heroes of the pro-life movement over those decades, those who serve women and children directly and the expression of the will of our people through elections that produce the individuals on this court. We ask you to encircle those Supreme Court justices in your grace, that their intellects be enlightened by it, that their hearts be uplifted by it, as they listen to oral arguments 
and in the subsequent days where they discuss the arguments that they have heard. We ask the same for those who will make those arguments before them and for every citizen of the United States and our elected officials and the whole world which watches and waits. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Mike, Marjorie, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We appreciate your leadership greatly. Two great pro-life leaders, and you can tell a little cold there in Washington, D.C. tonight. In a minute, we're going to go to the West Coast, where it's a little bit warmer. But for now, we're honored to have Myra Rodriguez lead us in prayer tonight. She is a former Planned Parenthood director of three clinics, and she is a whistleblower. Myra worked for Planned Parenthood of Arizona for 17 years and won a lawsuit against Planned Parenthood in 2019. Today, her story travels across the world. Her mission, to tell truth about abortion and truth about Planned Parenthood. Please welcome Myra Rodriguez. Thank you. And I will start my prayer in Spanish and I will follow in English so you will understand what I say. Thank you. Le doy gracias a Dios por el obsequio de la vida y por la vida de mis hermanos y hermanas. Nosotros somos responsables por los no nacidos, que no pueden defenderse. Sabemos que la tragedia más seria en nuestros días es la tragedia del aborto. Hoy nos comprometemos a nunca guardar silencio, a nunca ser pasivos, a nunca olvidar a los no nacidos. Me comprometo a ser un miembro activo del movimiento Pro Vida, a nunca detenerme en la lucha por la defensa de la vida hasta que todos mis hermanos y hermanas sean protegidos en nuestro país, en nuestra nación, con libertad y justicia, no solo por algunos, sino para todos. Padre, te pedimos que ilumines las mentes y los corazones de los hombres y mujeres en este Tribunal Supremo de nuestra tierra como tú has iluminado la mía, para que puedan conocer tu voluntad y tu propósito y plan para estos preciosos bebés. Tú los creaste a tu imagen y semejanza y no quieres que sus vidas sean tomadas de una manera tan horrible. Te pedimos que nos bendigas hoy aquí. Bendice a todas las madres embarazadas para que cada bebé en el útero reciba tu precioso regalo de la vida. Padre, deja que nuestras voces se escuchen hoy. Pedimos que estos niños vuelvan a estar protegidos por nuestras leyes y se les otorgue el derecho a la vida, la libertad y la búsqueda de la felicidad. Amén. I thank God for the gift of my life, for the gift of every child born and saved from abortion, for every mother who chose life, and the lives of my brothers and sisters around me. We are responsible for the unborn, who cannot defend themselves. We know that the most serious tragedy in our days is the tragedy of abortion. Today, we commit ourselves never to be silent, never to forget the unborn. I promise to be an active member in the pro-life movement, to never stop in the fight for the defense of life until all my brothers and sisters are protected. And our country is a nation with freedom and justice, not only for some, but for everyone. Father, we ask you to enlighten the minds and hearts of the men and women on this highest court in our land, as you have enlightened mine that they will be able to know your will and your purpose and plan for the precious infants in the womb. You created them in your image and likeness and do not will with their lives be taken in such a horrific way. We ask you to bless us here today. Bless all pregnant mothers, that every infant in the womb receive your precious gift of life. Father, let our voices be heard today. We ask that these children will once again be protected by our laws and be given the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Myra. <laughs> abortion knows no ethnic boundaries. In fact, many in the abortion business target our minority communities. And that's why we hear pro-life voices rising from those communities, and we are grateful for their leadership. Well, many of you watching online tonight are familiar with the pastor and church joining us from the West Coast, Pastor Jack Hibbs is the senior and founding pastor of Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, located in Southern California. Jack and his wife, Lisa, began a home fellowship over 30 years ago with just six faithful souls. Today, the church ministers to over 13,000 people on campus and millions worldwide each and every day through their daily media outreach and their weekly programs. Jack has a powerful pro-life story of surviving an abortion attempt. He has also led his church in standing up for the unborn by refusing to participate in California's mandate forcing churches to pay for elective abortions in their health 
insurance programs. In fact, they were represented by Alliance Defending Freedom. Jack, we appreciate you and your church joining us tonight from the West Coast. Well, Tony, thank you. And in fact, thank you for having us on this uh, extremely important time of prayer. Tony, I just mentioned to our congregation that we're probably looking at a decision that's coming up that uh, will be heard as you have so well already articulated that will define whether God remains in this nation or not. We almost uh, hear the doors, as it were, moving on the hinges as God begins to close the door. We pray that that would stop and we pray that he would open the doors of blessings. But of course, that means that we seek him and that we ask him to intervene. So from the West Coast here in Southern California, we're asking all of you to join us in prayer right now. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you, Almighty God, the God of life, God, we pray that you would descend upon the Supreme Court. We pray that you, you would take hold of the hearts of these nine justices. God, your word tells us that the heart of the judge, the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. And we pray, Father God, that you would spare our nation on this, the most grievous sin of all in our country, and that is of abortion. God, you despise child sacrifice. You hate it. And so, God, we beg of you in Jesus' name that you would hear our feeble cry. And, Lord, that you would sweep across this nation. Lord, that you would send a wind as wind dispels the fog. And, Lord, that you would reveal the truth and that you would speak wisdom to our justices. And, God, that you would speak wisdom to our leaders. And, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would repeal from off our land the scourge of abortion. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you, Tony, and God bless all of you that are praying for our nation today. Thank you, Pastor Jack. Well, tonight I've asked Bishop Joseph R. Kopax of the Jackson Diocese to share a few words with us tonight before he leads us in prayer. As a spiritual leader in this community, and our nation, he has a passion for recognizing the dignity of the unborn. Please welcome Bishop Kopax. Thank you, Bishop. It is a great honor and joy to be here and I thank, first of all, Bishop Ronnie Crudup for his invitation a month or so ago. He and I have worked together in the Lord's Vineyard on various causes for the common good in our beloved state of Mississippi. And little did I know in these past seven or eight years that it's such an ally on behalf of the unborn and the work he has done uh, for many years. So I thank. Uh, Bishop Crudup for this invitation and certainly Tony Perkins and all who have come from so far. So often we hear we stand on the shoulders of giants when we continue forward and in that sense we do this evening. There have been many pro-life warriors down through the years, especially over the last 40 to 50 years. But we have giants in this room and across this nation, right? Amen. Now, we're not saying amen regularly in our Catholic congregations, but amen. We can say that tonight. <laughs> One giant in our own Catholic tradition, of course, was St. Pope John Paul II, who 25 years ago wrote an amazing document, Evangelium Gaudii, Evangelium Vitae, the joy, the gospel of life. The gospel of life replete with wisdom. And I just like to refer to that before offering a prayer. Just amazing. The gospel of life is at the heart of Jesus' saving message to the world. Through the incarnation and birth of Christ, I think we have that feast on the horizon in four weeks or less, 
In the incarnation, God reveals to us the dignity of all human life. Each of us is made in the image and likeness of God, and we reflect his glory in the world. For this reason, direct attacks on human life, such as abortion and euthanasia, are always unacceptable. But sadly, these threats to life are often justified, protected, and even promoted by our laws and culture. Christ's gift of himself on the cross reveals how precious life truly is and gives us the strength to commit ourselves to build a culture of life in the face of a culture of death. Christ's blood shed for us promises that in God's plan, death will be no more and life will be victorious. To proclaim Jesus is to proclaim life itself. In every child which is born and in every person who lives or dies, we see the image of God's glory. We celebrate this glory in every human being, a sign of the living God, an icon of Jesus Christ. St. Pope John Paul provided a great deal of wisdom for the church's commitment to a culture of life, a culture that respects the dignity of the human person beginning in the womb and continues with solidarity on behalf of the common good. Pope John Paul would say that, consider a house. You have the foundation. That's the unborn. And upon that foundation, you build a structure. And that structure has many, many elements of the common good and social justice, but it starts with the unborn. And to be faithful citizens, we're called to be committed as we are hearing this evening and as you are here this evening. For my prayer, I'd love to offer the, what's called the Litany for Life. And it's from 1 Corinthians, and we're all familiar with St. Paul's Ode to Love. And taking each of those phrases, I'd ask you as I read one to, of course, say amen and then a little reflection, and we'll continue with this litany. So I begin, love is patient, Lord, amen. Give to the mother who is tempted to abort her child the patience to endure the suffering that will bring forth new life. Lord, love is kind, amen. Give to the new father whose friends tell him to abort his child the gentleness, compassion, and courage to support mother and child, protect them from all that could harm them, and sustain them against selfishness and hate. Lord, love is not jealous. Remove from all human hearts the temptation to trade human life for advantage, convenience, or personal benefit. Deliver us from the expediency that values personal gain and pleasure over the dignity of human life. Lord, love is not pompous. Deliver us from the arrogance that sees our needs or wants as superior to the rights of others. Help us to see our brothers and sisters as worthy of all our love. Lord, love is not inflated. Grant us a share in the humility of your Son who sought not to be served, but to serve. Help us to see in every human being rich or poor, young or old, guilty or innocent, a reflection of your image and likeness. Lord, love is not rude. Implant a spirit of gentle compassion in the hearts of each of your sons and daughters. Lord, that no person may ever be treated as less than a child of God, which you have made them through the death and resurrection of your only begotten Son. Lord, love does not seek its own interests. Give to all who govern us, Lord, a generous spirit that our country may not so much seek to be great as to be good, to be, not to be rich in possessions as to be rich in mercy, or to be renowned as to be renowned for justice and truth. Lord, love is not quick-tempered. Grant that by our prudence and patience we might learn to live that sacrificial love by which your Son died for us on the cross, that all men and women might know our kindness and willingness to love them unto death after the model of our Lord and Savior. 
Lord, love does not brood over injury. Give us the grace of mercy, Lord, that your Son might forgive all, seeking only their redemption and eternal happiness. Forgive the abortionist who takes the life of an unborn child. Move their hearts, grant them the grace of repentance, and give us a full share in your mercy. Lord, love rejoices with the truth. Implant deep within our hearts a sense of the joy of the gospel of life and make us joy-filled evangelists of your great gift of life. Lord, love bears all things. When we are insulted or reviled for the sake of the gospel of life, give us the courage and the innocence of the children of God. Help us, Lord, to suffer for the sake of your truth and never to seek our own good, even in the good work we do. Lord, love believes all things. Deliver us from every temptation to despair, Lord. When we are discouraged, give us the grace to trust in your mercy and to know that your love is victorious, even in the face of darkness, death, and hate. Lord, love endures all things. And in the face of death, destruction, and the culture of death, never lose sight of the beauty of the face of your only begotten Son, our Lord who died for us through his passion. May we know the strength that comes from you each day for your glory and the love of his little ones. Lord, love never fails. When the crusade for life seems unending and our latest initiatives have failed, when our hearts are filled with sadness or anger or fear, come to our aid, O Lord. Give us the assurance that you are ever with us, that your mercies will not end, and that you, our Creator and God, will bring victory to all who seek to love you as you commanded them. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Bishop, and I want to thank our brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church for being early and providing leadership for life. We're grateful for their years of leadership. Dean Nelson is FRC Senior Fellow for African American Studies. He is the Executive Director of the Human Coalition Action. He is also the Chairman of the Frederick Douglass Foundation, an organization that works across the United States to advance the sanctity of human life, free market principles, and limited government. Please welcome Dean Nelson to lead us in prayer. Thank you, Tony. How many of you know that when Christians come together, we win? The abolitionists during slavery, when they came together, Christians, we saw the end of slavery. When Christians came together during the civil rights struggle, we saw the advancement of all Americans. Ephesians chapter 4 encourages us to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for all that you are doing, Lord, in your church. Tonight, Lord, we humble ourselves. Lord, we acknowledge that in many ways we have forgotten you. And Lord, there's probably no area that is more evident of how we have rejected you and rejected your principles than Lord, what we have seen, Lord, over 60 million children lost innocently, Lord, to abortion since 1973. Lord, we humble ourselves and ask you, Lord, to forgive us for our national sins. But Lord, we also ask tonight that you would move on the hearts of your people. Lord, we thank you that we can come together, Lord, Protestant and Catholic, men and women, black and white, Lord, from all around this nation, Lord, to cry out to you, to ask, Lord, for you to do in us what we are unable to do on our own. Father, we ask for revival of our hearts and awakening in our culture, Lord, that we might see the end of the scourge of abortion in America. Father, we pray tonight for those justices, Lord, who will be hearing these cases, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would give them an ear to hear, Lord, and a heart to discern. Father, we pray for those who will be speaking, Lord, and giving the oral arguments that their words would be piercing, 
that their words would be, Lord, uh, seasoned with grace and salt. Lord, that those who are hearing, Lord God, may experience and understand, Lord, the true moral standard of the innocent of human life. Father, we thank you and we bless you for men and women, Lord, who have stood, Lord, on this issue, Lord, standing and speaking for those who cannot speak for themselves. So, Father, we also ask, Lord, for the women, particularly, Lord, who have found themselves, Lord, in the difficult decision, Lord God, being influenced, Lord, by, Lord, Planned Parenthood and others, Lord, convincing them that they need to, Lord, take the life of their preborn children. God, we pray, have mercy on them, and, Lord, send them, Lord, men and women of God, angels, Lord, to encourage them to make the healthy choice for their children and for their futures. And, Father, we pray that you would continue to unite us as your people, Lord, we confess that we will be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, born and preborn. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Dean. Well, our next two guests come as a duo. It's a grandfather and grandson. Flip Benham is a bold witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, especially especially when it comes to the most vulnerable in the womb and also loving the mothers who choose life. He founded Operation Rescue in the late 1980s and was its longtime director. Flip has spent time in jail for the cause of Christ in Wichita, Baton Rouge, Birmingham, Chicago, <laughs> Dallas, Houston, Orlando, Lynchburg, Charlotte, Washington, D.C. He's traveled the country. <laughs> but he also befriended Norma McCorvey, yeah. Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade, and ultimately led her to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had the opportunity, the privilege of baptizing her. He is joined tonight by his grandson, a young pro-life advocate, Bailey Benham. It is a powerful testimony to see from generation to generation standing for life. Please welcome Flip and Bailey Benham. Let's pray. Jesus, we honor and we glorify you in Jesus' name, Lord Jesus. I just pray that we would recognize that you are the one and only true God. There is no other God besides you, and you are the one that determines truth. The professors of universities do not determine truth. The President of the United States does not determine truth. You determine truth, and you alone, Lord Jesus. And you say that life begins at conception. Lord Jesus, and that babies in the womb are made in the image of God. So, Jesus, that is what we say, Lord Jesus. I just pray that you would specifically awaken my generation to the travesty of abortion, Lord Jesus. In your name, Lord, I just pray that my generation would see the end of abortion in your name. I just pray that we would see the last abortion clinic closed, Lord Jesus, in my generation. I just pray that we wouldn't be worried about a TikTok following or an Instagram following, but we would be concerned about little images of you being murdered in the womb every single day, Lord Jesus. I just pray that you would awaken us in your name, Lord Jesus. We praise you and we honor you and we recognize you as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. In your name, amen. 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 That is an arrow, an arrow. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For the Lord grants sleep to those he loves. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies at the gates. 
That's our call. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the privilege. I thank you for this arrow. I thank you for the arrows that you have now that are concealed in your quiver, and you're sharpening them, and you're ready to launch them from bow, the bow of family, church, and help them, we pray, Lord, this next generation to plunge into the bullseye for their lives, and that the gates of hell would not prevail against your prevailing church, and that, Father, we would be encouraged to try trust you to allow your theology to become biography right here in the streets of Jackson and that this abortion mill, this pink house at 2903 North State Street would come to an end. We pray this in the powerful name of our Lord, our Savior, and our very best friend, Jesus. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Flip and Bailey. Dr. James Bush III has served as a member of the Florida House of Representatives since November of 2018. Dr. Bush is a teacher and a member of Community Action Agency Board, chair of the Florida Martin Luther King Jr. Institute for Nonviolence and United Teachers of Dade County. He's representing pro-life elected leaders within the Democratic Party and we are honored to have him praying here tonight. Please welcome Dr. Bush. Let, let us pray. Oh God, I help in ages past and I hope for years to come. We come at this appointed place and anointed time in history because you suffered it to be so. We come because you said if we call upon you, you'll show us great and mighty things that we know it not. You said whenever we wanted to call upon you, we can call you from the honesty and the sincereness of our hearts that you would hear and answer our prayers. And because you are omnipotent, because you are omniscient, because you are omnipresent, you have all power, all knowledge, and you're able to see over the whole world at the same time. And we know tonight you know where we are, but it just gives us a sense of that blessed assurance when we can tell you where we are. We're here in the great state of Mississippi with the governor, with the president, Mr. Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council, with the great pastor of this house, and with all of the pro-life members around this country uh, from the north, south, east, and west. And we just pause to say we thank you. We thank you because you've been good to us. Matter of fact, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. And we just pause for station identification to say we thank you. We thank you for life, for you are a lover and giver of life. You gave your only begotten son so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. We know you are a lover of life for our little ones, our children. You declared a decree in your word. You said, suffer little children that come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of heaven. You said, unless you become converted as a little child, you will no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. You said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings have I ordained peace. And, oh, God, I know I don't have time tonight to just tell you how much we thank you for what you have given us and the life you have given us. So I'm going to be obedient by just closing this prayer and just say we thank you. And we just thank you for this day. For this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be exceedingly glad in it. And we're going to decree and declare that we've already uh, received a victory from the Supreme Court. So we're going to say in advance that we already know what the end result is going to be because you know our end at the beginning. And so now we just submit this prayer to the one who is able to keep us from falling, to keep us from the dark valleys of despair to the bright mountains of hope from the midnight of desperation until the daybreak of joy, 
be both power and authority, now henceforth and forevermore, is your servant prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you, Dr. Bush. As a Hippocratic physician, Dr. Deborah Honeycutt's calling is to minister health and promote wellness to others while keeping her promise to do no harm. The privilege of helping women during pregnancy and birth of their children led her to serving as medical director and member of the board of directors for the Pregnancy Resource Center, as well as being on the board of directors of the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs. As a current board chair of Human Coalition Action, she believes that advocating for political and judicial change will advance pro-life policies, maximize the cultural impact of the pro-life movement, and promote life-affirming social change. As a Christian, she understands that the power of fervent corporate prayer can change our society as we agree with God that unborn lives are precious and worthy of the opportunity to live with freedom to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Please welcome Dr. Honeycutt. Thank you, Tony. Pray with me. Great Creator, our Father, our giver of life, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives and in the lives of all those who make decisions in our government. As one of many Hippocratic physicians who, while keeping an oath to do no harm, have helped women manage their pregnancy and childbirth, I thank you for the advances in science and in technology that have underscored the truth of your word that unborn children are not just a blob of tissue, but are living human beings. Forgive us our national trespass of devaluing the life of the unborn. Forgive us our national trespass of killing our preborn children. Forgive us for sacrificing our unborn children to the gods of secular humanism, of progressive philosophies, of expediency, and other false gods. We pray that the hearts and minds of each of our Supreme Court justices will come in line with your will regarding the unborn and render a God-honoring decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dr. Honeycutt. It has been a complicated and challenging season, season for our nation, and we're thankful for the clear prophetic voices of our day. Bishop Matthews is that clear clarion voice for biblical truth. He currently serves as the missions president for the Church of God in Christ and has led the establishment of the Tabernacle Church of God in Christ in South Haven, Mississippi. Prior to these assignments, he and his wife Sharon and their children, he has 11, he's pro-life, served as missionaries in South Africa. He is a very special brother to me in the Lord, and I am personally grateful for him joining us tonight, and I am excited to hear what the Lord has to say through him. Please welcome Bishop Vincent Matthews. Thank you, Tony. Uh, feeling is mutual I honor, Tony, FRC. Bishop Crudup, thank you for hosting this day and grateful for all those who were in the program prior to me. So grateful for our governor and the words that he shared on today. But I wanna ask you a question. Are you really kidding me that we're here today? That literally, we're dealing with the issue that in one of the blackest cities in America, you got to go to the Supreme Court, 82% black folks in the city of Jackson. And you got to go to the Supreme Court to stop killing little black babies in, in Jackson, Mississippi, up until before they're born. Are you kidding me? And they had the nerve to stand outside and have signs to tell me that I'm delusional. This is interesting. And it's an interesting demonic time that we're in, my brothers and sisters, when right in our face we can see what's going on. And it's interesting because the Supreme Court has been wrong before. That's right. 
Yeah. The Supreme Court that. was wrong in 1973. And I know that because I learned how to read. Now, I know they didn't want us to learn how to read, but I learned how to read, and so I don't just watch the television, and I know what's going on. So are you really kidding me that we got to stand here today and have this conversation? This blows me away. Supreme Court has been wrong before, but it's corrected itself. It was wrong in 1857. In 1857, a black slave went to St. Louis and sued the government to say that he should be free. And in 1857, they told Dred Scott, you're not human. Because the science of the time said that people that look like me were not human, and the Supreme Court upheld that. They followed the science because they were ignorant, or excuse me, ignorant. They followed the science because according to the Darwinian science of the time, I, my forefathers, were the link between monkey and man. Now, they're still teaching evolution in school now, but thankfully, just about eight years later, with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment in 1865 through 68, it reversed the Supreme Court case and finally said that me and my children and my children's children really are human citizens and can vote. The Supreme Court can be reversed. Yeah, but are you kidding me? They did it again. Because I read, y'all sent me to school. Yeah, in uh, what year was that? 1896? Yeah, 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. Yeah, Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 said that you can have separate but equal facilities and restrict people from going to those facilities. So now that they're humans, the Supreme Court said separate but equal is okay. But praise the Lord, there was another case that went to the Supreme Court to reverse that one, Brown versus Board of, Ed, Board of Education in Topeka that said separate but, une separate but equal is not good enough and they abolished it. So once we got equal rights, 1973 comes. And then comes Roe versus Wade to say that there's now open season on not only those weeds and dandelions because after that they opened up all kinds of eugenic uh, facilities all across America and it just happened to put it where my cousins stay. Just, you know, it's interesting that in the whole state of Mississippi, there's one clinic, and it's right here in Jackson, where my cousin stayed. Literally, I got cousins here. So, what's interesting is that Roe versus Wade in 1973, against the science, but maybe they didn't understand, now said, it's legal to kill a child at any time in gestation. And yeah, 1992, they messed up again, as has been said, but it too can be reversed. It will be reversed this week, almost 50 years later, in the Dobbs versus uh, Jackson, uh, the Jackson Women's Clinic. I say to you, my brothers and sisters, I stand here with a lot of hope. I stand here knowing that Hobbs versus the Jackson's Women's Health Clinic can be reversed in 50 years, but it reminds me of a freedom, uh, I gotta pray, but it reminds me of a freedom meeting that can happen I'm so glad my wife was here, by the way. He mentioned her. That's her there, the woman there. Yeah, stand up, sugar, so they can see you. Yeah, they, yeah that's my wife right there. Yeah, mother of our 11 children. But it reminds me of a freedom meeting. And this freedom meeting went against governmental policy. It goes further back than the Dred Scott case. It's recorded in the annals of our historic text, the Bible. It's historic and it's, and it's accurate. In Exodus chapter 1, there were people who were oppressed. There arose a king who did not know Joseph. Joseph was a good man, and Joseph provided for his family. But this king had a problem because his family began to grow. And they started a governmental office of population control, kind of like the one we have now. And they, yeah, there is still an office of population control. And they started this office of population control to say these people are too many because they recognize that power is in numbers. It's not in the dollars because the Federal Reserve can do whatever they want with that, but they can't do anything with our children. And so they said, let's put work on those people and get them doing banal tasks, all confusing and have them all mixed up. But they grew stronger based on the work that they received. And as they grew stronger, the government became threatened by these ex-slaves. 
these ex-slaves who began to run around, but they began to get stronger. And so they made governmental res uh, 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 recommendations, not a recommendation, it was an edict that the boy children should be killed at birth. Just kind of like what's happening in New York and Virginia right now. And say the boy children should be killed as they were being born. But I thank God that there were some powerful, empowered women. Shipra and Pua. Who said we're not going to do like they said do. And they had these babies and the babies kept coming. And they said we can't kill these babies because these men and these women are lively women. These people are lively people who will not go away silently. And so I say to you, my brothers and sisters, those who are watching around the world, those who are in this beautiful church, that uh, their rose in that time should have been killed a deliverer, but there was a baby boy named Moses that was born because somebody made a stand. Somebody went against the government. Somebody didn't worry about the backlash. Someone didn't worry about what they would say. Somebody didn't follow what they've been told. They allowed God to give them a critical sense of thinking, and they went against it, and Moses rose up. And after a while, I can't give you the whole story. But when Moses rose up, he met God one day. Yes, he, because he lived, he had the ability to make mistakes and abilities to do some things. But out in the backside of the wilderness one day, God told him to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Now I'm here to say today, we pray to God to let my people live. We need to shout it. You need to say it with me. Let my people live. Let my children live. Let my children's children live. Let my children's children's children live. Let the one who will find a cure to cancer live. Let the one who will change the government live. Let the one who will be a great preacher, teacher, let my people live. And so the Supreme Court case must be reversed. I got two more minutes and let's pray in it because we're going to pray against the demonic spirit that is across America. This is not flesh and blood. This is not Republican and Democrat. This is not left versus right. This is, no, oh, this is not carnal. It is a spiritual fight we are fighting. We're fighting with demonic strongholds that didn't just show up today. They've been on his agenda for a while, but the blood of Jesus is greater. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I wish somebody would shout his name, Jesus. Hear our cry and let our people live. Let there be life in Jackson. Let there be life in Mississippi. Let there be life across America. Let there be life across the world. Let your people rise up on today. Awake your people out of their sleep. Give us to be advocates for life. Give us the fight for life. And give us the love life from the womb to the tomb. In the name of Jesus, Satan, the blood of Jesus rebuke you. The power of God comes against you. And we speak even right now that it is so. And it is so. Let my people live. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Amen. May it be so. From coast to coast, border to border, we're joined tonight from those all across America joining us to pray for the sanctity of human life, that America would return to being a nation that recognizes that life is created in the image of God. Joining us from our southern border in Texas tonight, Adrian Pina Garza. Adrian and her husband Jimmy are a living testimony of how God can change lives. Adrian has shared her story of how her life changed at an abortion clinic many years ago and how in that moment of making a life or death decision, God placed it in her heart to demand to see the sonogram. And she didn't take no for an answer either. Ultimately, Adrian ended up fighting for her child's life. She was 16 weeks pregnant and states that her son became a beautiful masterpiece, a fully formed baby who was literally fighting for life. Adrian, thank you for leading us in prayer tonight from our southern border in Texas. Thank you for being here today to pray with us for life. What a blessing it is to pray in agreement all over the country together. 
Thank you, Tony Perkins and the Family Research Council for this invitation. Here at New Life Family Church in Hidalgo County on the southern U.S. border of South Texas, we are filled with prayer warriors. We humbly ask that all come together with one voice throughout the region, the state, and country and pray. Today in America, we are all filled with opinions. Let's put them all aside and pray for the sanctity of life. Heavenly Father, we come here today to thank you for your presence, for your grace and your loving kindness. We humbly ask you to be with these justices as they make a decision that will impact countless innocent and defenseless lives, lives that are destined by God to live. We believe that through you, hearts can change. I am a testament of that. We humbly ask that you please give women going through uncertainty during pregnancy, the discernment, the compassion, and the boldness to choose life. Let's stand against the lies and the dangers of abortion and pray for the discernment of our leaders and our people. Help them see, dear Lord, that through you all is possible. We must continue to share the great news that all can be made new through Christ. Today, thousands of hearts and minds shine a light on life, on hope, on renewal and revival. Help us, Lord, to live our lives with complete trust in you. Please give these justices the courage and the resolve to choose justice for these tiny but innocent lives. Amen. Alma Perez of the Hidalgo YRs will be translating. Thank you. Gracias por estar aquí hoy para orar con nosotros por la vida. Qué bendición es estar unidos en oración en todo el país. Gracias, Tony Perkins y el Family Research Council por esta invitación. Aquí en New Life Family Church, en el condado de Hidalgo, en la frontera sur de Estados Unidos, con el sur de Texas, se encuentran muchos guerreros de oración. Pedimos humildemente que todos se unan con una sola voz en toda la región, el estado y el país para orar. Hoy en Estados Unidos todos estamos llenos de opiniones. Dejemos todo eso a un lado y oremos por la santidad de la vida. Padre Celestial, Venimos aquí hoy para darte gracias por tu presencia, por tu gracia y por tu bondad. Pedimos que guíes a estos jueces mientras toman una decisión que impactarán a muchas vidas inocentes e indefensas. Vidas destinadas por Dios a vivir. Creemos que a través de ti los corazones pueden cambiar. Te pedimos que des a las mujeres que atraviesan por la incertidumbre durante el embarazo, el discernimiento, la compasión y la fuerza para elegir la vida. Luchemos contra las mentiras y los peligros del aborto tardío y oremos por el discernimiento de nuestros líderes y nuestro pueblo. Ayúdalo a ver, querido, querido Señor, que a través de ti todo es posible. Debemos continuar compartiendo la gran noticia de que todo puede ser renovado a través de Cristo. Hoy, miles de corazones y mentes iluminan la vida, la esperanza, la renovación y el avivamiento. Ayúdanos a vivir nuestras vidas con total confianza en ti. Por favor, dé a estos jueces el valor y la resolu resolución de elegir la justicia para estas pequeños pero inocentes vidas. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. Commissioner Monica Sparks is the first black woman president of Democrats for Life, a national organization that exists to help pro-life Democrats win office and pass laws that are pro-life. Commissioner Sparks is currently serving her second term as Kent County Commissioner and is also president of the Kent County Black Caucus. Please welcome Commissioner Monica Sparks. Thank you so much. Abba Father. Abba Father. 
God, we are crying out to you, border to border, coast to coast, crying out to you. In a time, God, where abortion, murder is so acceptable, we thank you for the free will that you've given us. However, that free will has seemed to backfire that free will that you have given us, that gift of free will, has become something so distasteful, so pitiful. God, we are broken. And we have to cry, Abba, Father, because right now, the very thought of being pro-life is so heavy, but necessary. Border to border and coast to coast, we find strength within that whole area. Thank you, Family Research Council, for having us here. We thank you, Bishop, for standing for life within these very walls. The walls that should protect us, the church, have failed around us. But God, right here, right here, we find solace. We find strength to go on with each other. We find strength in knowing that the Christians, your people, need a win. This is your responsibility, Father. We lay this at your feet. The Christians, your people, we need a win, Father. Not a win for us, but a win to show that you reign supreme, not the Supreme Court, but you reign sovereign over the United States of America. We won't stop, Father. You said be not weary in well-doing, and we're going to keep doing well. We're going to stand strong, Father, and we're going to expect through the power of your Son that you've given us that we will have victory this week. And we thank you for it, Father. And we'll accept nothing less. And if it stops there, God, we will continue fighting until your will becomes the will of the Supreme Court of the United States. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Monica. Troy Miller is with us today because he believes every life is a gift from God. He and his wife, Marcia, have been blessed with four adopted children. They have been adoption advocates for nearly 30 years. They strongly believe adoption is an incredible gift to families and to children. He serves as the honorary chair for the World Orphans Day. He and his family live in Nashville, Tennessee, where he serves as the president and CEO of NRB. NRB TV. Troy, thank you for being with us tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful that you are seated on the throne and that you are strong and powerful and able to overcome all of these obstacles. Lord, we pray for those who will be arguing this case before the court on Wednesday, Lord. We pray that you would give them godly wisdom, you would give them clarity of thought. You would have them an answer to every question that would come up from the truth, from your scripture, and from your mouth to theirs. We pray, Lord, that you would soften the hearts of the justices, Lord, that will hear this case. You will open their eyes and their ears. You will make them, Lord, fear you more than anything. Lord, we honor life. We pray, Lord, for any and all mothers right now who may be thinking or contemplating abortion, Lord, we pray that you would soften their heart, that grace would overcome them, that they would choose life, Lord, and if they can't care for that child, Lord, they would give them up to a loving family that can. Lord, Mary, they, their situation becomes someone else's blessing. Lord, we love you and we honor you and we pray, Lord, that you would use this issue to unite the church, to unite this country, to make life 
a priority above all, for it is the foundation of all of our morality. And Lord, we give you all the glory and all the honor and praise in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Troy Miller. And we need to be praying in the days ahead, if the court does make the right decision, that there are more families that are willing to open their doors and welcome these children into their homes. We go one more time to the steps of the Supreme Court on the East Coast, where Tina Whittington and Mary Sox will be joining us. Tina Whittington has over two decades of experience of pro-life outreach with a focus on reaching and activating youth to join the pro-life movement. All of her work has been submitted to the fact that this is, a first, is first a spiritual battle and it takes place not only in the culture but in the hearts and minds of individuals at all levels. The Dobbs case opens up a new area for the Holy Spirit to work to abolish abortion. And Mary Sox serves as the director of the Center for Human Dignity at the Family Research Council. In this position, Mary researches, writes, and coordinates collaborative efforts with other pro-life advocates on policy surrounding life and human dignity. We're blessed to have her on the FRC team, and she's also a new mother, and she'll be leading us tonight in prayer from the steps of the Capitol along with Tina. Tina and Mary, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Tony. I'm really glad to be here with you guys tonight, and I'm thankful that we have a God who taught us how to pray, and so I'm going to take uh, something out of his good word to start us off tonight in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, this is what we come before you to ask today, that your perfect will, your perfect justice will be brought down to earth. We pray and plead for your Holy Spirit to intervene on behalf of the preborn this week as our earthly Supreme Court considers protecting preborn life in this Dobbs case. This week, we have a special opportunity to see your kingdom move mightily through the Dobbs case. We ask that the attorneys defending life will be anointed and the justices would have your divine discernment and wisdom. While we know we will never live in perfection this side of heaven, we do know that we are called to bring heaven's values to earth. We are called to pray. We are called to speak life and to engage in our government in ways that bring you glory. Help us at Students for Life as we focus on the young people and as we lead the pro-life generation to remember the preborn in our prayers, to be a voice to empower the life choice on campus and in our communities, and to not fail in engaging with our government to see heaven's values on life rule in our land. With a heart of repentance, we ask, that you would please forgive our nation for the sin of abortion and heal our land. We place our faith in you, not in the courts or the government. We believe that you, Heavenly Father, will bring an end to abortion in our nation. Amen. Thank you, Tina. Let's begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh God, we come before you today you who knit the unborn child in his mother's womb, you who made each of us fearfully and wonderfully, who has numbered all of our days, you who deemed it fitting for an unborn child to be the first to recognize the coming of your son. We come before you to ask you to move mightily in the Dobbs case. We ask you to grant wisdom and knowledge to Attorney General Lynn Finch and Solicitor General Scott Stewart we ask that their words might touch the hearts and minds of the Supreme Court justices. And we ask that all nine, Lord, all nine would rule in favor of life for the unborn. We ask for the day when America will once again protect the unborn child in the womb, when your creation will receive the respect that it deserves. Oh God, we know that you, the author of life, are with us. We know that the, in the end, the final victory is yours. And in Jesus' name, we pray that that victory may come. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tina, Mary, thank you so much for being with us tonight. 
Well, as a follower of Christ, an abortion survivor, and now a family pastor, Josiah Presley believes God has called him to speak for the rights of the unborn. God has called us to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly before him. He has said, quote, as one of the least of these who had no voice when his mother underwent an abortion, I believe the Lord has saved me in part to be a voice for others, end quote. We're honored to have Josiah leading us in prayer tonight. Josiah. <clears throat> Would you pray with me? Father, in Micah 6, you have told us what is good, Lord. You've told us what you require of us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you, Lord. Lord, we pray for justice to prevail this week. Lord, we pray that what is right would win out, God. And Lord, regardless of the outcome of the events of this week, regardless of the decision that the Supreme Court passes down, Lord, would we, as your people, be committed to justice? Would we be committed to what is good, Lord? Would we be committed to actions of kindness? Would kindness guide the way we interact with others, the way we love others, Father? Lord, this is such a controversial topic. This is such an issue with so much pain, so much hurt on so many different sides of the argument, God. We see the pains. We see the difficulties. We recognize the hardship of what is happening in our country. But Lord, as your people, God, as those who have been brought into relationship with you, Lord, would we win over it with kindness, God? Lord, would we remember that as we are speaking up for the rights of the unborn, as we are caring for, as we are loving the unborn, Lord, that we must also care for and love the born on both sides of the argument, God. Lord, would we show who you are through our actions and through our kindness, God. And Lord, we come before you humbly this evening, praying these things, asking these things, recognizing that the only change that will come in this country will be from you, Lord. We come humbly before you, submitting ourselves to you, recognizing that ultimately it is you we need to see move. Not the Supreme Court, Lord, but you, God. Lord, we come before you this evening, recognizing that we live in a nation, that we are citizens of a nation that for the past almost 50 years now has not walked humbly before you. Because for the last 50 years, God, we live in a nation that has committed over 60 million abortions. We, have, we live in a nation that daily defies you by destroying people created in your image, God. Would you forgive us, Lord? Would you humble us? Would you be, bring revival to this nation, Lord? And would it start with us? Would you use us for your glory? It's the name of your son, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. 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 Thank you, Josiah. Yes, may it be so that we would experience revival in America again. Dr. Brad Jerkovich is a senior pastor of First Baptist Church of Bozier, Bozier City, Louisiana. He is the founder, has helped found and lead the Conservative Baptist Network. Dr. Jerkovich has been involved in pro-life efforts across America for the last 30 years. He is a dear friend. And Dr. Jerkovich, thank you so much for being with us tonight. You bet. Let's pray together. Father, 22 years ago, Stephanie and I sat in a doctor's office nervous about what the ultrasound was showing with our baby, with the cysts on the brain. We were nervous. We knew all the percentages and what the odds were saying. And Lord, we knew that it was going to be interesting to hear what that doctor said that day. And he comes in and he says to us, he says, you know, from what I'm seeing, you guys are young. You can have more children. I would terminate this pregnancy and just try for a new one. 
And Father, by your grace and courage, we knew what your word says, that life comes from you. And we chose life that day. We emphatically said no. We began to pray. And Father, not only did you heal that precious baby in the womb, Father, we gave birth to her. And now 21 years late, 22 years later, she is serving as a labor and delivery nurse in Memphis, Tennessee, delivering babies. And Father, we have seen the power of faith, of trusting you, trusting your word, trusting your ways, and the power of choosing life. And Father, we are asking God that this week America would emphatically choose life. This is a moment that you have given us. And Father, I'm grateful for those who have prepared for the arguments, who are prepared to take a stand. I thank you for Family Research Council. I thank you for pastors like this pastor and pastors all across America, churches all across America. We have marched. We have prayed. We've asked you, God, to move. This is a week to move. This is a week to choose life. And we're asking you, God, to move in a way that emphatically says to this generation, life is from you, O God. And we trust you for life. And we're pleading with you, God, for life this week. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Jerkovich. Dr. Alveda King is from Atlanta, Georgia, and serves as the chair of the Center for the American Dream at AFPI. She is the daughter of the late slain civil rights activist, Reverend A.D. King, and the niece of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. King is the founder of Speak for Life, fighting for the sanctity and dignity of all life, from the womb to the tomb. She currently serves as a Fox News contributor and host of Fox Nation show, Alveda King's House. Dr. King is a former college professor served in the Georgia State House of Representatives, a former presidential appointee, and the 2021 recipient of the Presidential Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Alveda King, thanks for being with us tonight, and please lead us in prayer. Praise the Lord, Tony and Bishop, and all who are gathered here tonight. As we pray together for life, please join me. Put your hand over your heart, and let's indeed pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, we are sorry for all of our sins, including the sins of abortion across this nation and around the world. And we join together from sea to shining sea, asking you for victory on December 1st, melting the hearts of the United States Supreme Court in favor of human life. We are indeed one blood, one race. Lord, let us live from the womb to the tomb victoriously. Bless us according to Psalms 103. Lead us according to Psalms 23. And bless us with the blessings of Abraham. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Dr. King. Well, joining us tonight from the northern border, right outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota, is Michelle Bachman, along with her home congregation at Rock Point Church. In addition to being a former congresswoman and presidential candidate, this year she took on a new assignment as the dean of Regent University School of Government. She also serves as the chair of the FRC Board of Directors most importantly, and this is why Michelle is joining us tonight, she is a prayer warrior, intentionally committed to interceding for our nation and for our nation's leaders. Michelle, thank you for joining us tonight and for leading us in prayer. Amen. Join me. Father, we shout to your name from the north, Father. We shout your praise that you are God and there is none other. It is to you and you alone, O oh God, that we direct our prayers. We thank you, O oh Father, that you are the sovereign Lord. You are the Lord most high. 
You are the Lord of heaven's armies. Would you dispatch your heavenly host, Father, this week? We appeal to you, O righteous judge, in your heavenly courts. I ask, O God, that your Holy Spirit would fill the chamber of the Supreme Court during this most important moment when the arguments are made. But Father, these men are but dust. One day, these justices, men and women, their knees will bow, their tongues will confess that you are Lord. And so, Father, I pray that this week your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, Father, would you be present? Would you grant wisdom? Would your spirit fill their hearts and minds and bring revelation, Father, like no other time? We cry out to you. You hear us when we call. We trust in you and you alone. You have the power to save. In Jesus' name we pray and we trust. Amen. 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 Thank you, Michelle. Amen. I've asked Pastor Carter Conlon, General Overseer of Times Square Church in New York City and a member of the FRC board to share what God has put on his heart before offering our final prayer this evening as we are gathering across the nation to pray together for life. His ministry of nearly three decades has been centered on, marked by, and led by prayer. It is the passion of his heart. In 2018, he wrote a timely must-read book for anyone serious or desiring to be serious about prayer. The book is called It's Time to Pray. His worldwide prayer meeting each Tuesday night draws people from over 190 countries, consistently witnesses innumerable answers to prayers. Pastor Carter knows how to hear God's voice, and he has a personal and special word for us tonight. Please welcome Pastor Carter Conlon. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Pastor Tony, and thank you for all who've made the effort to be out here tonight and to be part of this, this gathering, whether it's in person in this facility or you're with us online from various places throughout the country and perhaps even throughout the world. I've spent some time in prayer, and I've asked the Lord to give me His heart and what He would have me to share in, in the close-up moments of this, this moment of prayer at what I consider and we all consider to be a very, very pivotal, pivotal time in this nation. And so, Father, as I open the Word of God, I ask you, Lord, Jesus Christ, as your Word says, that the entrance of your words brings light and life. So, God Almighty, I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would give the hearers, both tonight and in the days to come, those that will hear these words and will also hear the prayers that were prayed tonight, Lord Jesus, would you soften our hearts as a people, as a nation? Would you turn us from the hardness of our ways and our deep resistance to you and to your truth. Would you help us, Lord God, to humble ourselves in your presence and confess our faults and turn from our wicked ways and to receive into our hearts the promise that you will hear from heaven, you'll forgive our sins, and mighty God, you will heal our land. And so, Lord, we thank you, God. Give me the grace I need to speak this tonight. And Father, I ask it humbly before you in Jesus' name. Amen. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verses 10 and 11, these words are recorded by the hand of God. Do not remove the ancient landmark, nor enter the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is mighty, and He will plead their cause against you. This is a warning of God, a very direct warning of God, written in His Word, warning any generation about removing the boundaries as it is of acceptable behavior. And we've done that in America. I think the, the Word of God clearly describes good and describes evil, what is acceptable with God and what is not acceptable with God. And He warns all people, and especially those who could make the boast or the claim of once having known Him, He says, do not remove the boundaries that I have set around you, the boundaries of behavior that are acceptable according to the Word of God. And who can deny that we have done that 
in the United States, and particularly in the last several decades. We have gotten to the place where we now declare evil to be good, and we declare good to be evil. But the second part of that particular warning of God is don't enter into the fields of the fatherless. Don't take away the right of the children. Don't allow yourself to believe that children can be abandoned without consequence. And that is the dilemma, perhaps, of the darkened conscience of this nation and our generation, somehow believing that we can abandon our children, whether it's in the womb or whether it's even after they're born, and somehow there can be no consequence. And who can but, who can with a sound mind deny that we're not experiencing the, 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 the folly and the fruit of having abandoned our children in this generation to selfishness? The Apostle Paul wrote to his, his young disciple Timothy in the New Testament, and he, he warned that in, the new, in, in this last day in which we're living in, here was the warning that he wrote to Timothy. He said, but know this, in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. And I'm going to just paraphrase a few things he says about men, because I'm, I'm sent to the Lord to speak to men tonight. Men will be lovers of themselves, unloving, without self-control, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. <clears throat> and in verse 5, it, he says, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And he, he warns Timothy to turn away from this kind or being this kind of a person too as well. And it's about men. What will people become in the, in the last days? They will love themselves more than they love others. They will be unloving. They will have no self-control. They'll be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And Paul warns about the deteriorating conditions of a future day that we're now living in. Now, it has been said that the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable uh, members. And in that capacity, it is true that in America, just like in the kingdom of Babylon of old, the handwriting of God has come upon the wall. And God's Word tells us that you have been measured in the balance and you've been found wanting. The callous disregard for human life is one of the most ominous signs that our society as we know it is coming to a very quick and perhaps even a violent end more than we've ever even imagined it could. But the question I want to ask tonight is one that perhaps is not asked as often as it should be, is where are the fathers? Where are the fathers of the 60 plus million children that have been denied entrance into this world? I bring to your attention that in the Bible, children are never referred to as motherless, but they are often referred to as fatherless. There has to be a particular callousness in the heart of any man to abandon your children. It requires that you go against everything that God designed you to be. You have a DNA in your life that was planted there by Almighty God Himself. It's part of your makeup. It's part of your character. You are designed by God to be a protector of children. You're designed by God. That is what God made men to be. You are designed by God to be a provider for your family, for your children, for your wife, and for your family. You are designed by God to be a guiding voice for your sons and daughters in this generation. God himself promises to be to you and to me that voice that, that walks behind us and says, this is the way, walk ye in it. We are given that mandate of God to be that guiding voice in our homes and our families. In, in a secular sense and in a sacred sense too as well, we're, we're commanded of God to, to open the Word of God, the, the value system of God, and to make it known to our children and to guide our children into right living. The, the, the instances of fatherlessness in our children is, is literally staggering in this generation. I know, I pastored a church, pastored a church for 27 years in New York City, and I, I was flabbergasted. I remember our very first youth and young adult conference we had in New York City of about three, 400 young people had registered to attend, 75 to 90 percent were fatherless. New York City, father, not motherless, fatherless. No guiding voice in their life. To fail in this calling as a father and as a man can only mean that ultimately you love yourself and you love pleasure more than you love God. There is really no escaping this. And it is one of the great sins of our nation that our fathers have abandoned their God-given role. We, as fathers, we have abandoned our children in America, and our children are now in our streets. 
Our children are now committing acts of violence. Our children are out doing things they shouldn't be doing, all because there was no voice of the Father in the home. And this is a sin that needs to be repented of in America. And I warn you, I warn this nation, I warn especially the, the men of America that God himself has risen up against you and is pleading the cause and the case of the children. We are headed off a spiritual cliff in this country if we don't acknowledge our ways, if we do not humble ourselves in the sight of a holy God and say, God, we have sinned. This is a great sin in your sight. We can't go on just blaming others and blaming the mothers and talking about women and talking about abortion as, as, as important as that is and as much as it needs to be said. But the men take an incredible blame in this. I read a statistic just yesterday that any girl coming into an abortion clinic who has a committed partner, has a committed man in her life who wants to stand behind her, whether or not they're married, she is significantly at less risk of having an abortion than somebody who has nobody there in her life to give her an encouragement and to stand with her. Somebody that's just a voice that says, let's do this together. Let me not abdicate my responsibility. Let me not just be a selfish man who just uses others for pleasure and then walks away from any and all commitment that comes because of the life that is created. The Scripture tells us that God is pleading for the, he said, don't enter the fields of the fatherless for the Redeemer is mighty and he will rise up and he will plead the cause of the fatherless. But the mercy moment of God is written in Psalm 130 verses 3 and 4 where the psalmist says, if you Lord should mark iniquities, who could stand? In other words, God, we stand guilty, every one of us, of this. In some measure in our lives, we stand guilty of abdicating our responsibility to train and teach and stand and protect and provide for our families and our children. But the psalmist concludes by saying, there's forgiveness with you that you may be feared. And this is my hope. This is the only hope in my heart for America today, that we would have, we would pray for a deep sorrow. There has to be a deep sorrow come into the hearts of the men of this nation for what we have done. There has to be a spiritual awakening in our time for the nation, for there's no other alternative. Thank God, thank God for Supreme Court decisions, and thank God for the great good that will be done when the right decisions are made. But ultimately, we have a moral, spiritual problem in the nation that is so deep that all we're trying, we're trying to put a, a Band-Aid on a hatchet wound. It's not going to stop the bleeding. The only thing that's going to stop what's happening to the nation is a deep, heartfelt repentance in the sight of a holy God. For you and I to say, God, we have sinned against you. Yes, sin. It's an old-fashioned word. It's, it's an action against the Word of God that separates us from God, separates us from the life of God, and ultimately separates all humanity that live in sin from the presence of God for all of eternity. There really is a heaven and there really is a hell. And there's no soft peddling that. This is the future of all humanity based on our decision to love Jesus Christ, to accept him as Savior, and to serve him with all of our heart. So mighty God, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God, I stand before you tonight. Lord, and I recognize, and many others do, that there is no hope apart from you. We thank you for victories. We thank you for the times when we seem to rouse ourselves and somewhat turn a corner in our fight against lawlessness and debauchery. But, oh God, ultimately you have to come and defend the children of the nation. You have to come and defend us. You have to come, oh God, for your holy namesake and turn us from our sin and turn us back to righteousness again. Oh Jesus Christ, have mercy. My hope is that you went to a cross and when all of humanity was violently abusing you, in your last breath you shouted out, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And oh God, may that be your cry from your heart again. Jesus, you sit at the right hand of God. Let it come from your mouth one more time. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. They've become dark. They're ignorant of truth. Oh God Almighty, God Almighty, send a spiritual awakening into this nation. Bring prayer back into our homes. Bring prayer into our schools. Bring prayer into our government. Bring prayer, my God, back into this nation again. Turn us, Lord, from our sin.
Turn us from our indifference towards you and towards your truth. Oh, God, have mercy on this nation. Have mercy, Lord Jesus, have mercy. I feel like the blind man on the side of the road as you pass by. Oh, thou son of David, have mercy on us. Oh, God, for we're blind, we can't see. Have mercy as you did in days of old, Lord. It was the cry of one man that stopped you, Lord, in your tracks. You brought him and said, what do you want me to do? And the man said, that I might see. And God, I cry out on behalf of a nation tonight. We want to see you again. We want to see you in our homes, our schools, my God, in our streets, in our towns, in our courts, everywhere, God, in the nation, we want to see you again. Oh, Jesus, for your holy name's sake, send a spiritual awakening into this nation. One last time before you come. One more time. One more time before you come. Send a spiritual awakening into the nation. Turn our park benches into altars, oh God. Lord Jesus Christ, do what only you can do and do it for the glory of your holy name. God, hear our prayer tonight. Hear every prayer that's been prayed, oh God, tonight. But ultimately, we come to you. We bring it to you, Lord. And we say, God, we ask you to do tonight what only you can do. Send a revival to America. Don't let us, oh God, be cast into the dustbin of history. Send a revival. Help our children that are crying. They're crying for direction in every street corner. Help our children, Lord God. Raise the voices of men in this nation. Men. Have men stand up and be men in this generation. God Almighty, give us back the anointing to protect, to provide, and to guide. And Father, we thank you for it. Thank you for hearing our cry this night from coast to coast. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Carter. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. Let's stand together as the New Horizon praise team is coming as we end our night together. And those that are gathered across the, the nation and around the world that are participating tonight, I want to encourage you, if you're with someone else, in a fellowship or at home in a small group, I want you to grab the hand of the person next to you and let's stand in unity, praying that God would heal this land. Father, you have heard the prayers of your people from coast to coast, border to border, just a, a sample of the prayers that have ascended before your throne. Lord, we come boldly before that throne of grace, and we do ask you to heal our land. Lord, open our eyes. Open the eyes of this nation that we might see your truth. Open our ears that we might hear your word once again, that we, it might transform us as a people. God, have mercy upon us. Lord, hear our prayers. And do what only you can do in transforming our lives by the truth of your word. Thank you for hearing us tonight. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. This is the last song of the night. Would you come on, bless the Lord. Let's go out here with a shout because God is doing a great work in this nation. Come on, people of God. Our prayers have been heard in heaven. Let's go. Make a joyful noise. Sing a song, yeah. Of his goodness and his faithfulness. Somebody make a joyful noise. Sing a song, yeah. Of God's goodness, of his goodness and, his and his faithfulness. Come on, here we go. Say one, two, three. Say God, God, and pray. God, 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 God. Worship the Lord, God, 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 God. and magnify. And magnify. Just say it again. Just say it again. Say. God, 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 God. And pray. And Worship the Lord. Somebody make a joy for
the noise.